today we have a lot to cover. And so I, I kind of want to just jump right into it. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 13 uh, through 30. <clears throat> so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And uh, because we have a lot to cover, I'm just going to jump right in. And uh, we're going to look at verses, seven, or, I'm sorry, verses 13 through 16 first. And it goes like this. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. So people are bringing children to Jesus because they know when he touches them, uh, people are healed. And so these kids, they, they have needs. This is like, uh, you know, what's that uh, like hospital for kids at Jude, St. Jude's Hospital? This is like, uh, the, 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 you take your kid there when they're really sick. And so these parents have traveled for miles, maybe. They've traveled from nearby towns uh, to come to see Jesus so that their kids can get healed. But here's what happens to them. <clears throat> and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. Indignant is like a deep-seated anger, like not like a flash-in-the-pan anger. It's a deep, abiding anger. And so he's angry. He's indignant. And he says to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Now, I want to cover this section really quick because there's two teachings about children that are kind of important, two of them. And uh, we're going to do the last one first. So if you struggle with chronology, this maybe just ain't your day. Um, and so the second one is this. He says that if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to do so with the faith of a child. Now, how many of you have children, hang out with children, um, were a child? Okay, good. That makes, that makes I think, everybody. Um, here's the thing. If you have experience with children, you know this, there are no child pessimists. Every child, if they're growing up in a healthy, loving environment, they look at the world wide-eyed. They look at the world with wonder. Everything is new to them. And part of what Jesus is saying here is that the kingdom, when the kingdom comes, the whole earth is renewed. The whole earth is different. And part of being in the kingdom looks, is, it, what it's about is looking around at what God is doing here and now, because the kingdom is coming now. It's looking around at what God is doing and thinking, whoa, this is awesome. My mind is blown. I and mean, just think about what, how a kid would react to, to seeing something new. And that's, that's kind of part of, of what childlike faith is. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go through this passage. But I want to spend some time on the first thing. So we're doing the first thing last. Follow me. Um, <clears throat> The first thing that Jesus says is, is this. He says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Do not hinder them. There's a study that was done in the last 10 years. You may have heard me say this before. Um, and it was a study done that the, the people who did the study, they wanted to know um, of the kids who grow up in church, how many, how, what's, our, what's our stick rate? How many stay after they leave their family and they go start their own life? How many kids uh, of the ones that grow up in church stay in church? How many keep their faith uh, after they go to live their own life? Uh, and, and so they did this study over a few years. They, they followed these kids. Um, and, and basically what happened is they arrived at a Number. And the number is um, shocking, it's disparaging, but I think it's true to my experience and it's true to a lot of our experience with the church. And that, that number is this, it's 85%. 85% isn't the number of kids who stay, it's the number of kids who go. 85% of, and this is nationally, and it's a, it's a statistic, that's so hard to say, it's a statistic. Um, <laughs> I messed that one up in the first service too. Um, <laughs> it's a statistic. It's a, <laughs> You try this, okay? <laughs> um, it's a statistic, and so it, it's not necessarily accurate church to church, but nationwide, that's our number. That's our stat. <clears throat> and so let that sink in for a second. 85%, 15% stay. Now, here's what I think. If that number was like 25%, what I would think is like, okay, you know, that not everybody's going to accept Jesus. That makes sense. Uh, maybe 25% is just, maybe that's what it is, you know? If it was 50%, I would think, okay, we, we should probably do something. Half of our kids are leaving. That's not, that's not great. At 85%, here's what I think. It's a hindrance. The way that we have done church is producing 85% of our kids leaving. The, to keep doing that would be to go against what Jesus is saying, I think. And here's the thing. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a passionate believer of starting with why. Uh, whenever you go to do something, you should start with why am I doing this? Uh, because when you get halfway down and things get hard, uh, you can lose your motivation so easily. And so connecting to your why helps you be motivated in those hard times. But also connecting to your why keeps you on course. You, you know what I mean? Like, have you ever started a project maybe around the house and it morphs into just something else? You know, or maybe if you started something at work uh, and originally you were gonna, you, what you needed to do was to develop this system or to develop this thing 
thing, uh, this product, but all of a sudden, uh, halfway through, it turns into something completely different. W- what keeps you on course and what keeps you going when it gets hard is your why. And here's my why, standing up here today. The reason that I became a pastor, the reason that I'm here is because I want to reverse the trend. I don't want to be a part of a church that continues to produce 85% of the kids leaving. I want to be a part of a church that reverses that. I want to have 85% of our kids stay. And here's the hope. If that's a huge problem, 85% of the kids leave, here's the hope. Of those 15%, uh, what they did in this study, what they found is that those kids had something in common. What the authors say is the the number one predictor of whether or not a kid is going to maintain their faith uh, before they leave and after they leave, the number one predictor is this. They have a significant relationship with a Christian adult who is not their parents. That's the factor. A significant relationship with a parent or with a Christian who is not the, an adult, not the, who is not their parent. Um, uh, I messed that one up. <laughs> significant relationship with an adult Christian who is not their parent. Yes. Now here's the hope. That is so easy. <laughs> Do you know how easy that is? Do you know how open kids are to relationships? Kids, they just want to hang out with people. And so to reverse this trend, and it's just a start, it might not fix everything, but one of the things that we can do, this is very tangible, is we can go back in that kid's area and we can serve and make friends with those kids. Doing that would begin to reverse the trend. It's the number one predictor of whether kids maintain their faith pre-college and after college is that that relationship. And so here's the thing. If you want to be um, a part of a church that is doing something different, a church that looks at that number and says, we got to change because our why is to win people to Jesus, not run them away from Jesus. If you want to be a part of the solution, which is what I want to be so bad, and I'm not saying that this is the solution, but I think it's a good start. If that's something that that gets you going, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. There's a card in the seat pocket in front of you. It says, you rock. It's our volunteer card. You can pull that out, and at the two, uh, I think the top two boxes are children's ministry. Go ahead and check those and fill out your information um, on the the bottom part. And and here's what I want you to think. As you're uh, filling out your name and your cell phone number or maybe it's your email address, I want you to think this, I'm going to be a part of the solution. I'm going to do something to change that number. I'm going to be a part of reversing the trend. I'm going to be a part of changing the way that uh, Christianity is done. And I want to invite you guys to join us in on that. Now, part of being able to do this, uh, having this vision for our kids' ministry, uh, having it be a place uh, where, where kids can uh, have this relationship, it needs to be a place where that relationship is facilitated. In order to do that, um, we need somebody who's going to lead it. And um, so I want to introduce you to Andy. Andy, are you back there? All right, can everybody turn around and look at Andy? Everybody wave. Say, hi, Andy. Oh, you guys are so good. <clears throat> Andy, you know him because he's uh, Kathleen's husband. Kathleen is our worship leader. And um, he is, uh, he, the cool thing about Andy is he's uh, more educated than I am, and he has more experience than I do. And uh, over the past, you know, few months, um, he's really become a good friend of mine. And so um, I'm very excited about him being the leader back there. He's going to coordinate all of those volunteers. I wanted to introduce you to him uh, because I, whenever you see him, I want you to think this. We're, we're going to do something to change the trend. We're going to do something to reverse the trend. And Andy is a part of helping us do that. And so uh, if you want to volunteer, that's your guy to talk to. When you fill out that connect card or that uh, uh, you rock card, it's going to be Andy who is going to contact you and reach out to you and get you coordinated into that. Okay, that's enough about kids. If I had two hours, um, I would go through all of this really line by line because there's a lot of good stuff here, uh, but I have a half hour because that's the adult attention span, so that's your fault really, not mine. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Um, (laughs) I want to start this next passage uh, where we're going to be spending the most of our time. I want to start with this image. Can we throw this up there? Does anybody know what that is? It's a cicada. You can hear them. They're real loud this time of year. Um, I used to live uh, in a house in the woods. Maybe that's why I like the forest. And um, in August, uh, we would open our windows, even though it was hot out, because the sound of the cicadas would just kind of lull us to sleep. Uh, It's really beautiful. Um, I saw a cicada on the ground the other day, uh, uh, an adult one, and I just went over to pick it up, and I grabbed it like this. And my daughter's like, what are you doing? You're going to (laughs) die. Because they look, they kind of do, they look mean. But um, here's the thing, they're really nice. Um, Okay, what do you feel when you're watching that? Some of you are going to think, ew, I don't want to talk to you. Um, (laughs) For me, this brings up a question. How does growth happen? Look at how growth happens for the cicada. First, its insides begin to grow. Its wings develop on the inside of it. And as it grows, it gets too big for its exoskeleton. It gets too big for its skin. 
And what happens is they find a safe place. They can feel it getting tight. And so they, they find a safe place to sit, and all of a sudden they start to grow. And what happens is you can see that crack right there that happens in the top of their, uh, their exoskeleton. They literally shed their old way of living. They literally shed their old life, and they emerge something new. And I'd like to put to you this morning that that's how spiritual growth happens. That as we uh, live our lives in the spirit, as we're infused, you can go off of that. Some people are really grossed out. Um, <laughs> as we live life in the spirit, uh, our, our soul grows. In medieval times, they used to say, uh, they would call somebody who was, uh, who was spiritually mature, who had been growing really well, uh, they would say that they were magnanimous. It, it literally means a largeness of soul. Your soul grows. And as your soul grows, as your inner life grows, your outer life becomes too small. It's like wearing a pair of clothes when you're eight and then when you're 10. They just don't fit anymore. Um, or if you started, you know, skinny and then ate a bunch of brownies, um, that your clothes just don't fit anymore. And, you know, I've, I'm not saying it's true of me, but anyway. Um, <laughs> that's how growth happens. You grow from the inside out. That's how spiritual growth happens in Christianity. Uh, we believe that Jesus is after your heart. He's after your soul. And what he does is he changes you on the inside, and you change, like the song, from the inside out. And as we grow, we don't do it like the cicada does because we have flexible skin. But if you've grown really fast, you know that there's growing pains, right? Uh, maybe when you were a kid, you had literal growing pains, like your bones are growing too fast for your muscles, and it hurts. Or maybe you, um, like me, got into uh, high school and thought that you wanted to attract the ladies, and so you uh, started to work out, you know? And so then I'll forever have stretch marks in here because I just grew too fast for my skin. Uh, sometimes when we grow from the inside and we, when we start to grow fast, we can grow too fast for our bodies. We can outgrow um, our, this shell of that we're living in. <laughs> and so what spiritual growth is like is very much like this, that we get to a point in which we're growing so much on the inside that our old life, the, the life... Um, that we had been living before Jesus becomes constrictive. It becomes tight. It becomes harder to live because all of a sudden we don't value the things that we used to value. The things that used to drive us, fame, money, wealth, power, success, security, those things that used to drive us, all of a sudden they don't drive us anymore. And the life that we set up back here isn't the life that we want to live here. And what happens as we grow spiritually is we shed that old life. Paul has beautiful imagery in, in Romans and Galatians. He is always talking about dying to your old self. Uh, he calls it a death. Uh, and I think that he calls it a death for a reason. It's painful. It's hard. Because all of a sudden, maybe you've had this experience where you changed. Like your insides changed. And your friend group that you had, they didn't change. And all of a sudden, you don't really want to go to the, the things that they're going to. And you don't want to do the things that they're doing. And all of a sudden, you feel like, man, I, I don't know if I can live that old life anymore. And, and that separation, <laughs> that realization, that's hard because you have to die to something. <clears throat> and so that's how spiritual growth kind of happens. Now, um, it's about dying and it's about living. Something new emerges and it's beautiful. Uh, so what we're going to look at today is we're, we're going to be in this passage um, that you've probably heard before. It's, called, it's about the passage of uh, the, the rich young man or the rich young ruler, as it's called in Luke. And, and here's what I want you to see. We're going to go over it in a second. But this is very much a story about a man who started off on the right path right? Like he comes to Jesus and he asks this question, God, how do I attain eternal life? How do I move from this life to that life? How do I shed my old man and put on the new man? How do I become a new creation? He starts off in the right place, but something stops him. Can you imagine, as, and just imagine because I won't put it back up there, but seeing that cicada maybe start to wriggle and grow and then all of a sudden it stops and it dies. That's what happens to this man. And here's what I'd like to put to you this morning. That happens to every single one of us. If we're honest, there are places in our lives where we're not growing, and there's a reason for that. There are, there are times in our lives, maybe a season, where you entered into something that was hard, or maybe you entered into something that was wrong. You made a mistake, and, and you began to live your life in a way that wasn't uh, matching up with Jesus, and all of a sudden, your, your development, your spiritual growth stops. What's fascinating about this story is why it stops. Because why it stops is the same reason, I think, for many of us as well. And so here's what we're going to see today. We're going to see the problem. The problem is that he, he didn't, they stopped growing. Something needed to break, and it didn't break. So we're going to look at what needs to break and how and why it doesn't. And then we're going to look at the solution. We're going to look at the solution. And when you take the solution, we'll see what emerges. We're going to see the spiritual growth through the, through the lens of this case study, this story in the Old Testament. Okay, let's pick this up. This is uh, the rich young man from uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It says this. And he was setting out on a journey. 
as he was setting out on a journey. Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. So this happens on his way to Jerusalem. He's setting out for that journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, and let's just stop there for a second. This guy's starting off on a good foot, okay? I love this sort of model for, for prayer. He, he runs to Jesus, kneels before him, and asks him a question. Uh, if you're like maybe feeling a little convicted lately that you don't pray enough or that maybe you uh, find it hard to pray, there's lots of models out there. You can do little acronyms. I really like this one. This is an easy one to start. Run, kneel, ask. Uh, run, I mean, just do it immediately. If you think, oh man, I need to pray right now, just don't, just do it. Don't go do something else. Go and do it now. Run to Jesus. And, and then kneel. Bring your heart to a position before him of humility, uh, a, posi- a position of surrender, of sacrifice. Say, God, you are so high. You are so much more than, than I am. I just need you right now. Kneel before him and then ask a question. Ask him for something. God's the kind of God that you can ask him for things. This, is, this guy starts off in the right, uh, the right path. <clears throat> he runs, he kneels, and he asks. And then he says, this is what he asks. Good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. How do I grow spiritually? How do I reach the finish line spiritually? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's Jesus being really humble there. In Philippians, it says that Jesus didn't count equality with God something to be grasped. He's revealing that here. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. What's interesting about that is he leaves a couple of them out. Uh, I don't have time to go into that, but it's just like, what, why? Uh, And he said to them, teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. And I love this part. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. This is how I know the guy's genuine, because very often when people come to Jesus and they have an ulterior motive, he gets snarky with them. Have you ever noticed that? He gets a little sarcastic and a little biting. Uh, He he looks at this guy and he, he loves him. He loves him and he said to him, here's the thing you lack. You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Here's the problem. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is the problem in spiritual growth. Something always comes to stop us up. And in this guy's instance, and I'd like to put to you this morning, uh, many of our instances, the thing that gets in the way is this life down here. It's our possessions. Our possessions keep us from growing. What Jesus is essentially saying is that to enter the kingdom of God, to grow uh, spiritually, to become spiritually mature, what you need to do is you need to enter into true worship. True worship. See, worship isn't just something that we do on a Sunday morning. Uh, Worship is a way of being. It's, It's a way of life. It's a lens through which you see the world. And it's this lens that when you look at the world, when you look at things, you think, when you look at the good things you have, you think, God, thank you for my house. You're more important than this house. Uh, Thank you for my kids. You're more important than them, but thank you for them. Uh, God, thank you for this, my friends. You're more important than them, but but, but they are, uh, they're good too. So I thank you for them. It's this way of seeing the world in which you know that God is first. What's first in your life? Ultimate or true worship is, is uh, ascribing ultimate worth to God. He is first. Can we throw that next one up there? Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite theologians puts it like this. Uh, all, true worship is ascribing ultimate worth to God. We sang a song this morning uh, where we, you know, worthy is your name. Have you ever heard songs like worthy, worthy, you use the word worthy? When you hear a song like that, what the song is inviting you to do is to ascribe ultimate worth to God, to say that he is worthy. He is worthy of your highest worship. He's worthy of your highest priority. He's worthy of your highest position. Now, here's the problem. When Jesus is inviting this guy into true worship, he rejects, he rejects Jesus. Why? Because he had something that he valued more than God. And it was what he had. It was his possessions. It, said he, it says that uh, he had great possessions. Now, this is a huge problem. Because whenever we value something down here more than a life up there, whenever we value our stuff more than God, it will always stop us up. And here's, here's why. <laughs> There's actually many reasons, but I want to reduce this down to two. So many of the reasons why we choose down here instead of up there is, uh, number one, because of our identity. So often our identity is wrapped up in how much stuff we have. Our identity can be wrapped up in how big our bank account is, how large our house is, the year, make, and model of our car. And we think to ourselves, if I have this, then I am good. If I have this house, then I am good. If I have this number of money in my bank account, then I am good. And here's what happens. You tie your identity into the things that you have. And what it produces that makes it so hard to break, it, and that's what needs to break, is your identity and stuff. It's got to die. That old man, it's got to die. But what stands in your way is this. It's pride. 
Because as soon as you begin to accumulate more stuff than your neighbor, as soon as you get to have more stuff than your parents did, uh, as soon as you have the coolest and latest model of phone and your brother doesn't, what it produces in your soul is this thought, if, I am, if, I am, if my self-worth is tied to what I have and I have more than him, then that must mean I'm better than him. And this, we get addicted to this feeling, this feeling of being better than other people. And so what happens is <clears throat> our, our progress is arrested. Uh, we don't grow spiritually anymore. And, and this is a huge problem. Uh, the second thing that um, can cause this is our security is wrapped up in what we have. Uh, I don't know if, if you've ever talked to somebody like this, or maybe you are somebody like this, who, who thinks, if I have blank, then I'm okay. You know, then I'm safe. Or, or then I, I will be, my future is going to be okay. Maybe at an early age, you learned that you can't trust anybody. And so you have to make it on your own. And if you want to make it on your own, if you want to be secure in life, then you have to have the goods. You got to have the right stuff to make you secure. And maybe it's not like a bank account, but maybe it's like stockpiling stuff. You know, maybe you have a huge uh, pantry full of like doomsday stuff. You know, I mean, doomsday, we believe Jesus is coming again, so I don't think you need food for that. Um, <clears throat> just saying. But here's the thing. Um, so many times our security is wrapped up in what we have. So I know people who, who pay off their house as fast as they can, and that's a good thing, but the reason they do it is so that they can feel secure. What's driving them is this, is this anxious need uh, to feel safe. And here's the thing, living a life like that is living like your old man. You know why? Because your focus and your fixation is on your stuff down here instead of him. That your priorities are flipped. It's not God first, it's your security first. And what stands in the way, and this is the hardest thing I think, this is one of the hardest ones to break, what stands in the way of breaking your, getting your security from stuff is anxiety. I don't know um, if you're somebody who struggles with anxiety this morning, but if you do, it, you know this, it can feel like this beast that you can't overcome. It can feel like this monster that shows up whenever it wants and leaves you trashed and scattered and bruised and broken. It feels like this wall that you can't get over, like a barrier that you can't get through. It feels like something that will stop you right dead in your tracks. It's something that will make you call off work, uh, withdraw from your family. If you have anxiety, you know that this, is, this can be crippling. And it's one of the hardest things to break. And here's the problem. Left on our own, this is where we're at. We're either beat up by anxiety or motivated by a selfish pride. And the problem is, is that what we're trying to do is reach the kingdom. What we're trying to do is enter into true worship in which God matters, not our stuff. God matters, uh, not our security. God matters, not what our identity is wrapped up in here. We're, our identity is in him. And as we try to do that, the things that we face, what gets in the way is this, pride and anxiety. Now, that's a problem, but it's actually, it, it gets a little bit worse. Let's pick this up in uh, verse 23. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, he's going to double down, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, picture that in your mind, a camel going through the eye of a needle, than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. And you can see how they'd be astonished because Jesus is going around preaching the kingdom. Repent, turn around, come into the kingdom. He's offering people to come into this new way of living, this new way of being, into this new and better kingdom than the one that they're living in. And then he says, you can't do it. This whole thing that we've been, they're, they're like, we've been doing this for two years, Jesus. What, what are we doing if, you, if they can't do it? And they're so, they're so confused. And here's the thing. Um, he's talking about a, you know, a camel going through the eye of the needle. Uh, I've heard this taught um, many times, um, that the eye of the needle was like this uh, gate in, the, in a wall, and it was really small, and a camel, it's hard for the camel to get through, but the camel can still do it if it like bends down, and you scooch it a little bit, and maybe you put some rollers underneath, and you just slide it on through, you know? That's a, <laughs> Here's the thing um, that's been disproven, so if you've heard that, that's not an archaeological fact, that is what happens when everybody reads the same person, and the same person's wrong. So <clears throat> anyway, what Jesus is literally saying is the eye of a needle. <laughs> it's impossible. That, you ain't going to get a camel to get through that, right? He's saying it's impossible. And this is the problem. Not only are we beat up by anxiety, are we fed and driven by pride, but we are helpless. We can't stop it. But this is the good news. Jesus says this, because they're amazed. Like, who, who then can do it? Who can get into the kingdom of God? Who can grow spiritually? Who can break their old life and emerge something new? And he says this. Jesus looked at them. 
He says this, when man, with man, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things, all things are possible with God. Let's camp out here for a second. Here's what Jesus is saying. If you want to enter into true worship, where you have God first and everything else second, where you're not driven by pride or anxiety, when your identity is not wrapped up in your stuff, when your security is not wrapped, if, wrapped up if, in your stuff, if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to break your old man and emerge something new, you got to realize this, that with you, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Here's what this does. It brings you to a moment, when you really believe this, it brings you to a moment of true surrender. This is what true surrender is. It's recognized helplessness. A couple, couple weeks ago, we talked about how helplessness, not holiness, is a prerequisite to glory. This is the gospel, that we can't save ourselves, that God is the one who comes to save us. And this is the beauty of Christianity, because every other religion says you change yourself. Every other religion, every other philosophy, every other way of living says it's up to you. You've got to earn it. But in Christianity, what we believe is we couldn't do it but God comes to save us. This is good. This is good news. Um, <clears throat> but when you believe this, it brings you to a place of true surrender. Oh, I want to, let's leave that one up there. I forgot to say that. Um, the paradox, can we put that one up there? Sorry. The paradox of humanity is that when we think that we alone uh, must change ourselves, we only make it harder to change because all of a sudden we, ch- we get in our way. Do you know it's impossible to change yourself? In America, we have this thing called individualism where we believe that it's all up to us, like a lone ranger, you know, like it's, it's me versus my sin, and you're like, hey, this town ain't big enough for the two of us, you know? And that's kind of like how we, that's how we look at it, right? <laughs> like, oh, I can do this, you know? It's just a weak little thing, but here's the truth. Uh, have you ever tried to stop an old habit? Have you ever tried to stop your sin? It is impossible. It's not just hard, it's impossible. And the more, the harder you try, the more anxiety and guilt and shame you load upon yourself to make you change, the harder it gets. And so here's the truth. The truth is that Jesus comes to save us. And this is a major advancement in how we see religion and God. This is what Jesus came, this is the new thing that he's saying, that it's impossible with you, but I can do it. It brings you to a place of true surrender. Uh, have you ever heard that, uh, that phrase, like, you got to hit rock bottom? Uh, we, we often use that phrase when we're talking about somebody uh, who needs to make a change and how they're not going to make a change until they hit rock bottom. Do you know what happens at rock bottom? you recognize your helplessness. You can't do it. You come to a place in your heart where you're like, I I can't defeat this anymore. In AA, they have this uh, thing that they talk about a lot is is the more that you try to change yourself without realizing that helplessness, without being humbled, the uh, the harder it gets. You're only going to fail again. And so here's the the truth, that if we want to get to true worship, if we want to change, if we don't want to be driven by anxiety and pride, if we want to have a new life and to emerge something new, what we have to do is get to a place of true surrender. Now, when you get there, here's what's going to happen. Something is going to grow inside of you. You're going to grow. And the old man breaks. Just like that cocoon or that, that shell uh, that, that the uh, cicada had, it's going to burst. And it's painful because it's a death that you have to die to. But something new is going to emerge. Can we throw that uh, next chart on the screen? Instead of having your identity wrapped up in stuff and being driven by pride, you're going to produce a fruit of the Spirit called joy. Do you know how I know this? I know this from Psalm 4. Can we put that up there? This is Psalm 4, verse 7. It says this, You have put more joy in my heart than when they, than when they, have, than they have when their grain and wine abound. Here's what David is saying. When they have all the stuff that they have and they're throwing a party, when they have all the stuff that they have and they've built their whole life. They look pretty happy. Uh, the image in my mind is this. It looks like Scrooge McDuck. Anybody? <laughs> that dude's happy, right? He's got a lot of joy. Why? Because his grain and his wine are abounding. He's having tons of stuff. He, his security is, is he's swimming in it, literally. Uh, he's swimming in his identity. He, he knows that he's, well, where he's at is a good spot. But here's what David is saying. When you can break that and you can emerge into something else, what David is saying is you will step out of that old life and you'll take a couple steps away and you'll look at how happy you were when you had your stuff. And what you're going to think is, I have more joy now. Not then. I have more joy now in my heart than, than when I had all of that stuff. I have more joy now than, than all the people who are chasing the rat race, who are doing the stuff to build the account, to, to get the house, to have the family, to have the life. I have more joy now with none of that. And the beauty of Christianity is that when you can break, when you can die to your old self, your life gets easier it does. It gets easier. Here's another way it gets easier. When your security is broken, 
and when that, that need to, have secu- to get security from your stuff, here's a fruit of the Spirit that you will bear its peace instead of anxiety. Do you know why? Because when your focus, when it's not God, but stuff down here, when your focus is down here, you have to think about how to manage all of this stuff, right? Like, you, how many of you have ever woken up one morning and just thought, the stuff that I have to do today, my to-do list, it is overwhelming. There is too much. There is too much to do today. And you go through your day, and sometimes if you get really good at it, you can go through your entire life accomplishing task after task after task after task, never having peace because you are just anxiously running from one thing to the next. Do you know what happens when you get peace in your life? You're going to regain focus. And here's why. What anxiety likes to do is it turns on the what-if switch. And all of a sudden, when that switch goes on, <clears throat> all the what-ifs flood into your brain. What if I don't do this, then who's going to take the trash out? Uh, what if that spot on my skin is cancer? What if that sickness, that cough that my kid has is, is a really bad disease? What if, what if, what if? And all of a sudden, you'll spin out. And your brain, here's what anxiety does. It scatters your thoughts. And it's really hard to focus when you have all these other things yelling at you, seeking your attention. But when you can move to peace when you can come to a place of recognized helplessness and true surrender, when you can move to true worship to say that, God, you're the only thing that matters. None of this matters. All of a sudden, the what ifs, they shut off. Because so what if? And all of a sudden, you can focus and you can have peace because, you're, because only one thing matters, not all of these things. Now, anxiety has, can have like biochemical problems. And I'm not saying um, that, that just making a simple, like believing a, a verse is going to change your life. But here's what I think. It, it's going to start to. <laughs> it's going to start to. And, and you might have to look at other things in your life, why, you're ha- why you have that anxiety, what's causing all of this. But here's a great place to start. It's ascribing to God ultimate worth, putting him on the throne instead of all of your stuff. It'll give you focus. But peace will also do this. It'll also give you calm. Does anybody here struggle with calm? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> like, you know, you go through life and, and you just look at everything and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. This is all, this is all wrong. And you've you got no chill, bro, you know? Um, <clears throat> when you have peace in your life, here's what happens. So what if it's all wrong? So what if they're not doing their job right? So what if that person's not on time? So what? That is not the most important thing. The most important thing is God. And when you can move to true worship through true surrender, you'll bear peace and it will give you a sense of calm. Try it this week. Yeah. Try running to God, kneeling before him in true surrender and see that you, and ask him for a heart that, that truly worships and see that your life doesn't change a little bit. And see that you don't grow a little bit inside so that something begins to crack. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard and it's going to be painful. But as that thing cracks, you will emerge something new. You'll begin to bear joy and peace as a fruit in your life instead of pride and anxiety. Now, um, I want to move on and talk about the reward. So we've seen the problem uh, and we've seen uh, the solution. The solution is the gospel, that we realize that we're helpless and that we need Jesus. Now, here's the reward for those who can go through the process. Here's the reward for those who do truly surrender. Peter uh, is the first to speak, as he always is, and this time it goes okay. It doesn't usually go okay for him, but this is verse 28. Peter began to say to him, see, Jesus, look, we have left everything and followed you. We've, we're doing it, Jesus, we're doing it. You know, you can kind of see his, his attitude there. And Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, there is, he comforts him, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive, here's the key word, now, who, who will receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, it's in there, and the, in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are last will be first and the first last. Let's break that down a little bit. Here's what Peter's saying. It's kind of, or what Jesus is saying. It's kind of funny that he's saying it to Peter uh, <clears throat> because uh, P- Peter, if you know the book of Acts, um, Jesus dies uh, rises again, ascends into heaven, and then Peter does this travel. He goes all around. And guess where he stays when he's out of town? He stays in other people's houses. Uh, all of a sudden, he, he, had, he gains a community because he left uh, his possessions, because he surrendered to God. What he left behind uh, was all of his stuff. But then he gains houses a hundredfold. He stays in, all, and he, whose food does he eat? It's their food. 
Wh- whose water does, th- does he drink? It's their water. All of a sudden, he gains this new community in which he has a hundredfold. It sounds like health and wealth almost, you know, like, uh, like just trust God and he's going to give you a ton of money. But here's the truth. When you belong to a good church, when you belong to a good community, what happens is you gain whatever you left behind to follow Jesus, you gain it a hundredfold. Not just houses, but also uh, fathers and mothers. Uh, how many of you have had a spiritual father in your life or a spiritual mother in your life? How many of you have had a, a friend that was closer than a friend? It was more like a brother. Uh, how many of you have had uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to go and stay at somebody's cabin or to go over to somebody's house or to just enjoy their stuff for a little while? The truth is that when we give stuff up, and here's what Jesus is saying, the church is your reward. Let that sink in for a second. How many of you have ever thought, man, I want to go to the church because it's my reward? Not many of us. Because the reality is that 85% of us leave. When Jesus is saying that the church has to be, is, it is your reward, it's very often not. And so I don't know about you, but I want to be, I want to be a part of something that's going to change things. I want to be a part of a solution. I don't want to continue to do things the way that we've always done, making people leave and pushing them out. I want to be a new place. And part of that is being a place where where we have a culture of warmth and friendship and welcomeness, and welcoming, I mean, because when people walk through through that door and they come into this church, what Jesus is saying is, here's my reward to you. And we need to live up to that. I I believe this. And so I don't know, there's a lot of things that probably uh, could be different about church, uh, but here's one thing I think that we can do to make a change. Uh, We can begin to see people through God's eyes and not our own. We can begin to see the person who's sitting next to you who maybe smells a little bit, yeah? Don't raise your hand if that's you, because we we know, I gave him a hug earlier. Um, Maybe the person who, who sm- is, you know, it's hard to sit next to. Maybe you need to start seeing them. Yeah, it was you, Ian. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, you need to start seeing them through God's eyes and not your own. All of a sudden what happens is if we got everybody doing that, this place would be different. It would be transformed. It would be like walking into the arms of Christ instead of walking into a judgy, Christian, churchy church. Right? Don't you want that? I think that that would be beautiful. You know what I think? I think that that would start to reverse the trend. I think it would reduce that number from 85%. I think that a church like that is a place where people want to belong. It's a reward instead of a curse. So that's part of what Jesus is saying. But he's also saying this, when you receive a hundredfold, he's also saying that you get God himself. Here's the thing. God is a better house than your house. Over and over in the Psalms, David says uh, that God is a refuge, a strong tower, a stronghold. What David is saying is that I am more secure in your house than I am in mine. It is better to be in your house than it is in mine. God's a better house. He's a better father. That's one of the reasons that God says that he's a father, because he wants you to know that he loves you. He delights in you. He wants to take you out of whatever you're struggling with, and he wants to hold you in his arms. That's the kind of father that he is. The Old Testament has several uh, instances in which it refers to God as a, as a mother. Uh, it says that he births the mountains. It's in, in the beginning, the spirit hovers over uh, the waters like a, like a mother bird over her eggs. Uh, that's kind of the, the imagery that's going on there. God is a better mother, a better parent um, than, than you've ever had. God is a better brother, a better friend, a better, f- uh, a better uh, children, better everything. Everything that God, everything that you have, God is better. And here's the deal. When we can move from valuing our stuff to valuing him, it's going to produce that peace and joy and patience. Because all of a sudden, when you're down here, life gets hard. It's okay, because you've got the up there stuff. you got the good stuff. you got the better stuff. And that will change your life. I, uh, I'm going to bring the band up. And um, as I come up, I'm going to finish with this story. I, um, I was on vacation this week. And um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was okay. Um, and then we were coming home. So I've got five kids. And I don't know if you've ever driven for more than an hour in a car with kids. Anybody? 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 Yeah. I just understand hell a little bit better now. Um, but um, so we decided to time this. You know, we're going to leave so that, the ki- so that they can, we're going to leave late so the kids can sleep. This was our, this was our hope. But uh, kids don't sleep well in an unfamiliar place. You know, like if you don't usually sleep in the car seat, then it's like, eh, you know, they're not really into that. So an hour and a half of screaming later, um, it's like 10 at night, and um, we're driving from northern Michigan down to Toledo. And, and as I'm driving, I can feel my car begin to kind of like shake a little bit. I'm just like, no, no, 
no, no, no, no. <laughs> like, we're in Detroit, God. <laughs> I just, if you're going to do something, do it now, please. Um, <clears throat> we get through Detroit, thank God. And then all of a sudden, as we get around the, uh, the exit, um, our tire, my tire goes, Poof! back tire. And I pulled over. We were fine. Um, it was good. But um, this had happened to us once before. And I have this uh, really an, an anxiety dream because uh, when we were pulled over the side of the road once, I saw, I was looking in the back rear view mirror, I saw a semi like hit the bumper strips, you know, and then pull away. And so I have this anxiety of like being over, pulled over next to the road and somebody just, you know, and boom, then, then your family's dead. That stinks. So, um, so I'm sitting there, I'm freaking out, right? I'm, I'm stressing out because I got these kids that I love. I got this wife that I love. I don't want them to die. And, and at the same time, okay, I got to change this tire. It's 1030 in the, in the middle of the night. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I can change a tire. So I go back and I open the, uh, the, the place where the tire is. Guess what? No tire. Whenever you go out, buy a used car, make sure it has a spare. Um, that's what I learned. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, I've got, I got five kids, seven people in this car. We've got to get off the highway somehow. So thankfully, this was a God thing. Um, the tow truck driver came and, and, and arranged for us to have transportation to his place. And, and then um, what's amazing, you know, I said that the church is, um, is our reward. Somebody in this church, I'm not, I'm not going to grind it. I'm not going to do it. Somebody in this church drove their car at 1 a.m. to pick us up when I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know how I was going to provide for my family. And I didn't know what, I didn't even know, oh, there, oh, there's so many problems. How do you fix it all? Somebody came in the middle of the night and picked us up and took us home. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you what, that, what reward that was. And we got home and then last night, or sorry, this morning, um, no, wow, my brain, I told you it's scattered. Um, yesterday, my uh, two-year-old, she, um, she's a wiggly one. She, if you've ever heard me talk about her, she's the one with uh, the huge blue eyes. Um, the other day, I, I just, man, I'm, I'm super nerdy. I, I write poetry sometimes, but um, I, I was just writing. Um, <laughs> I didn't plan on saying this. <laughs> I, I was writing, and I was just like, God, you, like in the beginning, you, you, you said that let there be light, and, and I just got like, whenever I look at my daughter's eyes, I, I believe I believe it because that can't be. That's supernatural. I'm sorry. I went there. Um, she, so this this little girl, she's super wiggly, and and she like she's in she's in this in this chair, and she uh, you know she, there's armrests like this, and she kind of wiggles in between the chair and the armrest, and she gets her head stuck, you know, <laughs> like kids do, and she's freaking out. And my wife runs over, and she's like, it's okay, and they you know they get her head out, and she looks uh, to my wife, and she's like gets this like I don't know if I want you, and she says I want my papa. That's me, and I'm in the other room, and I'm just like. Yes, this is amazing. If you're a parent and you know you've been to that place where your kid says, I want you, that might be the best thing in the world. And so I went over and I picked her up and she, she knows, she knows she's got the sweet spot where her, her cheek touches my cheek and her other cheek touches my shoulder and I can just nuzzle her really, really good. And, and that's why she wants Papa because I'm a good cuddler. And, and I sat there and I held her and, and I just thought about the intense anxiety I had the night before. And I just thought about how the end of that week had been so horrible. And I thought about if I am an imperfect father, a sinful man, a, a man who has a broken heart, a broken way of seeing the world, if I, if I as a father get this much joy in holding my daughter, how much more joy does the father get when, when he gets to soothe our anxieties, when we run to him with true surrender and, and true worship, when we come to him, if I feel this good, how, how good does God feel when we come to him? And so here's what I want to invite you to do this morning. Go ahead and stand up. And, and as you stand up, know this, that, that maybe you have an imp, like a impure or a, a, a fallen way of seeing fathers. Maybe you, have, maybe you had a, a bad dad. But what you need to know this morning is that if you are struggling with anxiety uh, because you have security in your stuff, what you need to know is that it's okay to leave that and it's okay to come to a place of true dependence, of true surrender, because that God is standing with his arms wide open and gives him so much joy for you to run to him. This next song is all about surrender. It's about how good he is. It's about living a life for him. And so what I invite you to do, just, uh, just to take a posture of worship, what I like to do is just put my hands at my side like this. This is a, just a, God, I'm just ready for you. I'm ready to receive you. Maybe you can just pray this prayer in your heart. Just say, God, I surrender everything to you. Say, God, empower my soul to enter into true worship in this next song sing together. 